All right, so welcome to Japanese mythology. Uh, my name is Joe Munson. I'm going to be the moderator for the panel. Um, we'll go ahead and give uh, Jess and Keith a moment to introduce themselves briefly. Uh, so go ahead, Jess, you go first, and then we'll go with Keith. Hi, I'm Jess. Um, I'm really into Japanese mythology. I have kind of done an independent study of some of it, mostly with like the yokai. Um, there's still a lot that I don't know because there's a lot to take in, but I've been in love with the Japanese culture since I was like 13. So almost 20 years now. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Keith Haas. I'm an intercultural historian. That means I study what happens when cultures meet each other. Uh, I guess I started liking Japanese stuff when I first saw Godzilla. And I liked it so much, we watched it in Japanese. There you go. Thanks. All right. So uh, my interest in Japanese mythology goes back to uh, when we lived in Japan for a few years. Uh, my wife and I lived over there. And uh, since then, uh, I have many, many books and uh, have read lots of stuff about it, um, studied it, written articles about it, stuff like that. So um, we'll go ahead and just jump right in. Uh, this is kind of an unusual question because there's not a one specific answer for it. But what are the what's the kind of basic creation myth uh, or myths that they have in Japan? Uh, we'll go with Keith first. Okay, there is a couple books that talk about uh, the creation myth, but to be honest with you, I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about because this is kind of a, a family friendly convention and the Japanese mm -hmm. before uh, European takeover were very, very different people. And uh, basically the seventh generation of gods came down and were to create the earth and one of them uh, drank the water she shouldn't have and began to spew and puke and other stuff all over the waters of creation and created the plant, uh, the many islands and lands that we love. And over the years, many spirits came forward and created new and great islands uh, made after their likeness. So if uh, it's a fiery uh, creature, you're going to find a volcano there. If it's kind of a calm tortoise-like uh, creature, you're going to kind of find this nice kind of soothing area for the land. They really incorporate uh, the gods with the land and how it looks. All right. Yes. I actually, so this is one that I didn't know. And I was like, I should know the Japanese creation myth. I, I did research papers on other creation myths. I should know what this is. So I actually went and looked it up and it starts with just, there's dark and then the light rises to the top and then the light particles rise, but they're not light. So they form the clouds and then heaven. And then three gods are spontaneously born and they're genderless. And then they go into hiding and two more are born and they're genderless and they go into hiding. And then you get these seven generations afterwards. And the first two are genderless beings spawned spontaneously by the universe and they go into hiding. And then you get five generations of male female pairs, the last of which is Izanagi and Izanami, who then go about creating everything. All right. So lots of hiding going on. Yeah. yeah lots of gods that appear and disappear. Yep. Yep. So uh, uh, go ahead. We should point out that there are millions of gods. So yep. just being like, oh, you know, these are the major ones doesn't really work in Japanese mythology because everything has a god. That rock yeah. has a god. Exactly. You'll see uh, when you're wandering around in Japan, especially where I lived, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, as they call it, Inaka, um, there are little tiny shrines everywhere, I mean, literally everywhere. You could see them all over the place. Um, sometimes they'll have little shelters built over them um, that are just big enough for the little tiny whatever that happens to be there. 
Um, usually it's a little stone figure or something like that. Um, not always, sometimes it'll just be a rock with an inscription on it. Uh, other times it'll be really big, big enough that a person can stand in it or more than one person. Um, those ones you'll often see in some Japanese animation shows or live action shows. You'll see people taking shelter there during rain or something like that. Um, so given how many that there are, uh, in the various mythologies. And really, that's one th point to make is um, people think of Shinto as the Japanese mythology, but it's not just that. Um, Shinto is kind of a made from a bunch of stuff that was already there for many hundreds or thousands of years. And so how do all these various deities expect to be venerated? Let's we'll start with Jess on this one. So from my understanding, it varies a little bit. They all expect to have some kind of little shrine, this place that they can call home. Um, and they want to be remembered. They want to be honored, not just be like, oh, I don't like this one. I'm, we're not going to talk about this deity. We're just not going to think about that. They want to be remembered. As there are so many of them, especially, they all want this little place that's like, this is mine. This is all mine. I don't have to share this with anybody. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, traditionally, you can just leave a little, little bit of food or a little bit of rice to be like, oh, hey, there you go. Or something that reverences the thing that they are. So if it's a, a tree, you would leave a leaf. Or if it's a, a rock, you would leave a little pebble. And yeah, you, you find those everywhere. And then they'll have a festival for some of the shrines. And these things happen at least once a week if you're in a big city. So you get accustomed to hearing the drums and the, the sound of people just walking through the streets. And you're like, oh, Tuesday again, huh? Yep. So yeah, there are definitely lots of ways. Uh, again, if you watch various Japanese shows, whether it's live action or um, or animated, you'll see in a lot of them, not every one of them, but in a lot of them, you'll see little bits and pieces of this uh, all through the shows, just a quick stopping and bowing or uh, leaving a mikan or, or food, like you were saying, uh, at the various shrines. Uh, a lot of times when people take shelter in them, they'll apologize that they're intruding, uh, things like that. So, um, are they, are these deities or spirits that they have, uh, just ones that have always been around or do they have new ones that come into being? How does that work? Pete? <laughs> well, I mean, there's some that have been around forever and there's mm -hmm. some that have just been born yesterday. To yep. the Japanese, everything has a spirit. And this is very opposed to European ideas where a spirit or a soul is only something that humans have. If you watch uh, anything about robots in European culture, you will see that the robots are kind of evil because we're like, well, they don't have a spirit. So we have like the Terminator or, you know, the droids from Star Wars or something like that. When you go into Japan and they show robots, the robots have these personalities and they're like, oh, yes, I want to be, I like my life. And they don't want to be human. They just want to be robots. They like being robots. So the story of Pinocchio would be completely different in Japanese culture. So, you know, are they new or are they old? Uh, yes. When we have millions upon millions of deities, it's impossible, impossible to just describe them all in one large uh, lump and sum. Yeah, speaking of Pinocchio, the there's a, a show that's become more well known over here based on a, a manga in Japan called Gummu, which over here is known as Battle Angel Alita. Uh, that's basically the story of Pinocchio. So it's yeah. completely different in the way it's presented, though they do also have a few shows uh, that they've done live and animated that are uh pinocchio like the one from italy 
So, yeah. Um, Jess, did you have any thoughts on that? Um, my my first thought is it's going to be both because there are gods that are born at the beginning, like Izanami and Izanagi, and all of their descendants. But then, uh, technically, if you look at that Japanese creation myth, the imperial royal family traces their lineage back to Izanami and Izanagi's grandson, I believe it was. No, it's Amaterasu's grandson. Yeah. Um, and she's descended from yeah. Izanami or and Izanagi, depending on which myth you look at. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's both. And so there is still everybody born today from the Japanese royal line is technically a little godling based on that mythology. Yep. That actually gets into uh, one of the questions that you have is how does uh, Chinese mythology work into uh, Japanese? And that entire kind of caste system is Chinese. Like, oh, this god is above this god, this god is above this god, this god is above this god. That's very Chinese. And the Japanese uh, took that, and I hope you don't hear the train two blocks away from my house. Uh, but the the caste system is very much so uh, a Chinese mythology. They didn't, they don't have that normally. However, there is some cool myths with the Japanese emperor. For instance, if he has three uh, sacred objects that are descended from the gods, and technically we don't know if that's actually in their hands. Or there is a pool of, there is a place in the ocean where maybe it's been dropped. And nobody's allowed to go looking for them in there. Because if you find them, you are the emperor. Yeah, it's kind of, you see some of that um, bleeding over into Western uh, popular culture. Uh, one of the more recent ones is in The Mandalorian with the Darksaber. Uh, the person who possesses it is the one who's the ruler of Mandalore. So you kind of see that at the end of the last season, they they went into that a little bit and that caused yeah. a little bit of conflict. So uh, we have something very similar in Korean mythology as well, where they have like the sort of Dangun, one of their like first gods who the people are descended from. And if you find these sacred objects, and you can take that power for yourself and they don't want that so they intentionally hide any information about like the sort of dangun or these other holy relics yep yeah exactly same thing with korea there are sacred mountains that they'll reference their emperors or their leaders come from apparently the uh the leader of north korea was born by unicorns uh on upon the sacred mountain in north korea makes complete sense i believe it totally yep. i'd buy it all right hey, we so, believe in throwing swords and you're a king so you know yeah there you go makes as much sense and probably uh, works as well as women handing out swords from pawns so yep it's a great way to determine the monarchy exactly so uh are there constellations or stars that are associated with Japanese mythology. Who wants to take that one first? I, I don't know of any. So start Jess, if you mind. want to. Go ahead, Jess. There, so there actually is, I believe it's Tanabata that's about the two lovers. And I can't remember the male's name, but the female is Orihime. And Tanabata is celebrating mm. when they come together in the sky and they can finally see each other. And it's, they're, um, I think they were gods, but I don't remember the whole mythology for that one. Um, but yeah, it's it's about these two constellations that are in love, but they can't see each other. Kind of like how the Roman constellations are like chasing each other across the sky. These two are constantly trying to find each other, and Tanabata's when they're finally in the sky together, and it's really cute. Yep, but pulls in the Milky Way with that. That's the river that divides them. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the ones that I know is uh, related to some things in Japanese mythology is the Pleiades. Over in Japan, it's called Subaru. 
um, just like the car company. Yeah. So yeah. So there, I mean, there are That's there why are their logo ones. is stars. Exactly. Light dawns in a bunch of the audience's minds. I bet. So they're like, oh, <laughs> that makes sense now. So uh, in Japan, there are obvious differences between the various regions in Japan and the way they approach things and stuff like that. Are there various uh, gods that are specific to only one region and none of the others pay attention to them? And are there others where everybody pays attention to them? Yeah. I mean, uh, oh, the island Sapporo is on. They have a lot more frost giants and ice giants than uh, mm -hmm. anybody else does. Entirely because, dude, it snows eight feet there. Yep. That's, that's common. Whereas in Okinawa, you will not hear about frost giants for no apparent reason. But you will hear about pig gods. Very true. And the um, Shisa, I believe, the, the lions. Yeah, the lion the dogs. Bad. Yep. So, all right. There's actually any... a reverse of that that I learned about recently, where mm -hmm. there are locations that claim that they have specific ties to the greater deities that everybody knows about. They're like, oh, no, this god was born in our area, so we have the mm -hmm. biggest shrine to him. Yeah, and, and near where I lived in Japan, there's the location where they um, all the gods take vacation on occasion. <laughs> they go on vacation there. Um, that's actually one of the spots where, uh, or the spot where there's the myth where uh, Amitarasu got mad and hid herself in a cave there. Oh. And so all the gods decided we got to get her out there somehow because the world's dying because she's the sun. And so, so they did their little uh, suggestive dancing going on there and encouraged her to come out of the cave. And when she slightly opened it, they grabbed her and yanked her back out so that the world wouldn't die. So, uh, yeah, that's, kind of fun you can actually go visit that area that's right along the sea of japan uh, up in the mountains that are facing so i bet there's an onsen pardon i bet there's an onsen there there is there is one there there's more than one <laughs> so oh yeah gotta celebrate the gods with an onsen so <laughs> Since I imagine most of what we know is with popular culture in Japan, uh, what are the most popular uh, myths that often get referenced in popular culture in Japan? Let's we'll start with Jess. She made a an O sound. So oh, this is actually where it gets really interesting for me, and this is why I know more about yokai than any other Japanese mythology, because that's the only one I've seen in anime aside from the little spirit houses that show up in Miyazaki movies and the Kodama and such most of what you see is the spirits like the Oni and the Kitsune and the Tanuki um, you don't see a whole there's not as much representation of the gods as they are are the everyday spirits and gods um, you don't hear a lot about Izanami and Izanagi and Susanoo and Amaterasu and Tsukiyomi. You hear a lot about, oh, there's this kitsune that lives down the street. There's a kappa in that pond. Don't let your children go near it. That you see everywhere in Japanese culture. You see it in their movies, in their anime, in their books. Um, sometimes in their music, even. You will hear about their local spirits. You don't hear a lot about the gods. Um, and I, I, in some ways, I think it might be that it's it's too sacred. You don't want to say anything bad about them by mistake and get smitten or something. But at the same time, some of those gods they know so little about. Um, Ukiyomi in some literature is genderless, and in some literature has a gender, depending on who you talk to. And there's so little known about them that they can't even decide on what whether or not that god has a sex. 
So in some ways, I think it's just the lack of knowledge about the gods. But they know about the kitsune down the street. They know about the tanuki that lives in the forest. Yeah. Very true. Well, that's because there is a tanuki in the forest. Yeah. It's harder to reference a great god when you're like, uh... But you know that there's probably going to be a kapha in that river because there's an actual salamander that looks that is based on the kapha. It it grows three to four feet long, and if it was hungry, yeah, it would take a kid. So peep, uh, normally it's it's perfectly nice, but you see that thing coming near your kid, you know, move it out of the way because yeah, these had, are huge. Yeah, we had some of those living in a river near us. Yeah. So they're kind of cool looking. So oh, none yeah. of them were that big though. They're they're most of them don't get more than a foot and a half or so long. The ones yeah. that, at least it's where still we pretty live. Pretty so. big. Yeah. They're yeah. Those kind of commanders out here salamander. get like an inches maybe. Yeah. Yep. Uh there's also giant uh what is it? Catfish. And uh, there's oh, yeah. a, a big, there's a famous uh, story that earthquakes are being caused by a catfish underneath Tokyo, I believe. And every time it gets angry, it just kind of shakes the ground. And so they're, whenever they reference uh, an earthquake, they're like, somebody go feed the catfish. <laughs> yep. Very true. Um, just as, as an example uh, related to this with people talking about local deities, um, there's a show uh, now the name dropped out of my head uh, but there's a, a an animated show where the a girl suddenly finds out that she's become the local deity and she learns that there are responsibilities that go with that and that she has to do certain things in order to take care of the people in that area and mm -hmm. it's just kind of a um, interesting take on things where someone can just suddenly become that without uh, any choice of their own they're just here you go suddenly you are in charge so and i mean a lot of people think oh well then i'd have all the power and in this show at least she learns that's not the way it works she has a lot of responsibility to the local people in taking care of requests and stuff like that so so it's it's was a very interesting take on that. So. Yeah, that's uh, when we talk about Jap Japan, we should also talk about Japanese culture. And in Japan, uh, everything is about the the community and mm -hmm. not about you know the individual. Yeah. So you know all of their shows, all of their legends, you know, are about an individual helping the community, and mm -hmm. it's very rare that you find you know one person who is just like. Yes, I'm great because I helped everybody, and now everybody's praising me because I'm great. Yep. And usually they end up dying on a bridge because they couldn't challenge the guy correctly. <laughs> so, you know, there's also uh, a little bit of a difference for children in Japan. And a lot of our legends and myths about children are, are different because of that. In the U.S. especially, the idea of sending your four-year-old four out to just go explore is not something you would do. Not anymore. Whereas, yeah, well, yeah. Whereas in Japan, it's like, yeah, go play. And you'll find a four-year-old out two miles away from nothing. And they're right. they're catching dragonflies and stuff. And as soon as you see that kid, you're like, oh my gosh, I understand Pokemon. I understand the legend of Zelda. I understand half of the, the legends I've heard because they really are just letting their kids go explore. Whereas we wouldn't. And you see that in more rural, rural areas around in the States, too, where kids will just go out and explore, yeah. just find out things, learn about the world around them. So um, what are some of your favorite myths? We'll start with Keith this time. Uh, I think I referenced one of them, but I forget his name. Uh, it, it sometimes de deals with Momotaro and sometimes it isn't. But there is a legendary figure who goes out on a journey to uh, defeat some bad guy that has wronged his family. 
and he gets a holy sword and then he gets uh he goes onto this bridge and the person on the bridge says i have beaten 999 people and it is uh prophesied that i will never lose until the thousandth battle and so they battle and the guy on the bridge becomes you know his his uh companion and then they end up you know near this area and it has nothing to do with his journey and they die and that is completely different from the way a european story would be told where you know of course he goes on and he wins the day in japanese they're like no he died he lost that's the end of the story uh the other one is momotaro which means uh peach boy and uh i guess we need to explain that before europe japan had very different ideas on how things should work and how things are and then after uh not european settlement uh when japan opened up they decided or opened up for trade they decided that they were going to be more european so they took on a lot of european ideas they literally imported people from england to teach them how to be english and th that's not a joke to this day you will see tv shows of them trying to drink tea and be proper and stuff and it's really weird uh they'll they'll dress in victorian clothes to be like look how proper we are today and after that point they actually changed all of their stories so the story of Mobotoro is an old woman and an old man uh they they haven't had children their entire life and then one day they find a giant peach huge huge peach in the river and they pick it up and they eat it and in the original story this peach gets them amorous and nine months later they have a kid in the uh now cleaner version they find the kid inside of the peach and he's called peach boy because he came from a giant peach and he goes off on adventures and uh some you know really cool stuff they even have a song for him in japan and he's referenced in just about every anime and every tv show i've ever seen he's even on a uh, crackers just he's huge yes there's a cat in my window um he likes to come visit us um one i have a couple of favorite one of mine i it's because i grew up reading manga and watching anime and this myth appears in both yu yu haku show and in fushigi yugi very prominently and it's that that four directional gods and then the constellations that are under each of them um, that was one that I always found fun because there's so many different personalities you can go and explore and you can do the four directional gods in so many different ways. And because it's a multicultural thing, it came from China. Um, you can look at all these different cultural um, things that are in there. It's, it's a really fun one to explore because there's just so many gods in it. Um, and again, going back to the constellation question, you have seven constellations for each direction that are based in mythology. Um, another one of my favorites is when Susanoo, for whatever reason, is up in heaven and he's saying his goodbyes and he throws a horse at his sister and that's what sends her into the cave. He's just this crazy man-child. Um, that's a pretty fun one. So do you like the, the story of the lovers? Um, Abata being separated by the river of the Milky Way. That one's really sweet. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots of fun little ones. So yeah. if someone wants to learn from the popular culture about some of these myths, what shows would you recommend as ones that contain a lot of the a lot of the mythology? I'll, Do you hot show? Like Go ahead, Jeff. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, both have so many ideas. Um, Yu Yu Hakusho is really good. That's how I learned about a lot of different Japanese spirits, the traditional ones. They deal with a lot of Oni. They deal with Kitsune. Um, they deal with some of the gods, and they deal with the different levels of the world. So you've got the earthly realm, you've got heaven, you've got the spirit world. Um, which sometimes is hell and sometimes is not, depending on how Western the translation is. Um, 
and it it's a really good introduction to the everything has a spirit mentality okay uh i i recommend this to anybody who's trying to learn a culture watch the kids shows mm -hmm. like uh watch um what you call power rangers is actually from a show called sentai and then watch uh, another show called Common Rider, and they will actually reference Japanese culture and Japanese mythology as much as they can because they're actually trying to teach kids this is how our culture is, this is how you should think. And it, it will actually uh, do a really interesting thing to you because they will have moral stories that you will disagree with, and you will realize that the, the differences between the cultures of Japan and the U.S., especially when they're referencing U.S. cultures and then turning it into kind of a, a Japanese thing. There was an episode where they had to dance, and they all had to dance together, even though they were swing dancing. And it just drove me nuts watching that episode. Because I'm like, no, everybody dances you know, separate and does their own thing. And they're like, no, no, we must dance together to fight the enemy. And I'm like, you, you've completely missed the dancing <laughs> understanding. Yep. When different cultures collide, that can sometimes impact that. And one of my favorite ones for shows that incorporate a whole lot of mythology is an older one called Udusei Atsura. Um, it's basically about a bunch of aliens that come back to reclaim Earth, and they're planning to wipe out humanity because Earth belongs to them. But instead of wiping them out they give earth a chance where they play their national game uh with one of with a champion they pick and then earth picks a champion and for some reason they pick a lecherous high school kid named ataru and he gets to play tag with the daughter of the leader of the the oni who have come to take back the earth and he wins uh, through an accident. And uh, all of the, the characters from the, the Oni and the other aliens that you encounter, every single one of them is from mythology. I mean, you have the oh. Oni, ob that's pretty obvious with that. Do you have um, the Yukiona or the Snow Woman? Um, you have. I mean, pretty much all of them. You have Ben Ten and her whole crowd that are part of the the seven gods, and I mean that it, it's just every single one of them. It's amazing how Takashi took all of that and turned it into this really goofy uh, comedic science fiction show, basically. So, huh. so I would highly recommend that one if you can find it. So it's harder to find these days. Um, let's go ahead and open it up for some questions. There probably are some. I haven't been keeping track of that, but if we can get some of those. That would be great. OK, the, the first question is from uh, Shelley Eli. But when did the Chinese caste system start impacting the Japanese mythologies? <laughs> Which time? From the beginning? I'm going to say uh, from the beginning. Yeah. Generally, we believe that uh, Chinese conquerors arrived in Japan around 600 AD. So that's, that's a good starting point. But Japan has been open to trade with all sorts of groups for untold amounts of time. So we honestly don't know when certain things arrived. And they, they like to take culture and turn it into their own a lot. Uh, I was, I was going to bring up uh, Shinigami, uh, which is the Japanese take on the Grim Reaper. They saw the Grim Reaper and said, yes, we have those two. And so they just made a bunch of uh, Grim Reapers, uh, just Japanified. So sometimes it's a cute girl with a sickle. And sometimes well, bleach. it's a... Uh, yeah. Or sometimes it's a... Uh, whatever that thing is from uh, OneNote or... Death Note. Yeah. That's the monster, monster yeah. reapers. Yeah, it's, 
it's a Grim Reaper. It's just the Japanese took it that way. So when did the Chinese come in and do that? It's unknown. However, we can really see the empire system really working around 800 AD, 6 to 800 AD, and that's probably around the time it, it happened. Yeah, they imported a whole lot of things from China. I mean, they have the obvious writing system imports. Uh, a lot of the the art styles and stuff are derived from Chinese and Korean uh, mm -hmm art styles. I mean, there there's so many influences. It's like any culture that you have around the world, the ones that are around them influence them the most. And there's no culture that's just this pristine uh, field of driven snow that has no other influences. Uh, every culture has those. And with Japan, China and Korea, and other places right around there are the ones that were right next to it. So they had the biggest influence. Yeah. Actually have in some of their mythologies, they have their gods visiting ancient kingdoms of Korea and China. Yeah. Actually have stories about uh, Izanagi going to the kingdom of Scylla. Exactly. So next question. Uh, Ellis uh, or Ellis Curtis has uh, two questions. Uh, can you uh, suggest a good resource for learning more about Japanese mythology? And what are your favorite retellings of fictional or, or fictional stories that Japanese uh, that uses Japanese mythology? For example, Spirited Away. Who has good resources? I'll take it. Uh, Wikipedia. As strange as it sounds, I I wanted to do a quick review. Just went through Wikipedia. They've got every single myth and legend in it. And there are some websites out there. I, I can't remember them off the top of my head. And they'll show the originals and then a translation of those originals next to it. And those those can be useful if you want to do the real academic, real deep search. Um, and yeah, Studio Ghibli, Spirited Away. They talk about Japanese mythology a lot. Uh, and uh, it yeah, Studio Ghibli would totally be a great example of stuff you could find with Japanese influence. I'm thinking of Princess Mononoke. Mononoke is actually a uh, a Sturgeon type of spirit. It's an evil spirit, or uh, it's an animal spirit, and so that's kind of why it's being she's being called Princess Mononoke. Is she's a human that is taking on the spirit of another animal, and. To play off that, um, the Mononoke aren't really evil per se. They just have their own agenda. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll find that a lot in Japanese mythology. They don't have things that are just innately bad most of the time. It's pretty much they have an agenda that you don't understand. And oftentimes it's at odds with what is good for you as a human. And so, so it's, it's, different than they don't really have the same kind of thing in Japanese mythology uh, as we do over here in the Western world with you have the Judeo-Christian God and Satan who are 100% polar opposites. In Japan, they don't have that so much. It's very gray all through their whole mythology. I had a thought. I would also say wikipedia for resources because it has um actually looking up the creation myth last night they have a lot of site of sources cited um, on the japanese mythology wikipedia pages you can go through each deity that has their own page and find all of these sources in japanese and english you can find the first couple of books that these myths come from the kojiki and i can't remember the other one um and you can go and it's look up the name. original myth transcribed. Yep. So yeah, yeah. use oh. the sources on Wikipedia for sure. Keith? Uh, another media example that would really help you out, uh, Akira Kurosawa made a uh, short film compilation, and it was entirely about Oni and uh, different spirits and people dealing with them. 
And that should really give you an idea of how the Japanese think of things, especially if you want to just see good film, because he he was one of the Japanese masters of film. So yeah, and I think the second half of that question we already answered with some of the examples that we gave. So um, do we have a, any more questions? Um, Franco asks, how can you incorporate Japanese mythology without culturally appropriating their myths? Who wants to tackle take that? Grenade. They don't care. They they don't mind. In fact, they would be insulted if you didn't. Just just be like, oh, this is Japan Japanese, and they'll be like, yeah, it is. Uh, maybe somebody's calling me. Uh, there is kind of this weird thing where if you grew up kind of foreign yourself, uh, you kind of hold on to the culture you have a lot closer than if you grew up surrounded by that culture. And if you are in Japan and you're Japanese and you're surrounded by that culture, you're like, yeah, take it. I don't care. Whereas when you're in the U.S. and you're Japanese and you want to reference this this culture that, you know, you know very little about, you, you tend to be kind of a little more uh, careful about it. And so that's that's actually what's happening. The Japanese themselves don't mind. The people who are just trying to rebuild their culture in a, a foreign land are asking you to be a little nicer. So the best thing to do is just be like, yeah, this is Japanese. And just play off it a bit. You know, if, if you have a giant boy made of peaches, I think they'll laugh. Uh, if, you know, you prescribe and say, this one is evil, this one is good, that might be a little bit off because, like Joe said, there's no good and evil usually. Yeah, and maybe treat it with respect. So, Jess, did you have any thoughts? That's the same thing that I've been hearing is the people of Japan are like, yes, please, you know, use our culture, wear kimono. We think that's awesome that you guys are interested in our society and our culture. And um, we've actually, my husband and I watch a lot of YouTube videos and some of them are Japanese people who are saying, you know what, I'm not offended by this. I think it's awesome. This is a great way to learn. Um, like, oh, if you're wearing the kimono wrong, you're not sure that you're wearing it like a dead person or a living person, because that's a thing. Um, you can ask and they will be like, oh, yeah, I will absolutely help you. If you just show up saying, oh, I know more about your culture than you do, then they'll get offended. Um, if yeah. you just show up with this laissez-faire attitude of, I don't care if I'm wrecking your culture or showing it incorrectly, I'm just going to do what I want. But if you ask questions, if you look for that information, they are super helpful about it. They love when you are trying. It's the same thing with learning the language. As long as you are trying to understand and trying to do it right, love it. Yep. Yeah. Well, There's so, a certain point where, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, well, uh, there's a certain point when you're learning Japanese and you, yeah, and you go in to uh, deep Tokyo and you start speaking Japanese to them and they'll all be like, you're awful at this, please speak English. But that's because they're a lot stricter about things. They're very, uh, they take Japanese culture as something greater than just Japanese culture. And that's, that's where things start to get into the problems. Uh, but yeah, as Jess said, as Joe said, they don't mind too much. And so long as you're showing that you're excited about the culture, they don't mind. But if you try to show that you really know about the culture, they'll be a lot stricter and a lot uh, meaner about it. Yeah. One thing, when, when I lived in Japan, um, they give gaijin or foreigners uh, a lot of leeway because they expect that you know nothing. Once you show that you do know something, then they'll hold you to it. So if they know that you know how to be respectful in your speech and know the different levels depending on who you're talking to, they expect you to do it. Uh, the same thing with the culture. Once they understand that you understand something really well, they'll hold you to it. So um, we'll go ahead with the last uh 
comments take about a minute each. Uh, we'll start with Jess and then go with Keith. And just any final comments you want to say. Japanese culture is massive. There's so much to learn. Um, learning the different kinds of spirits, learning the different gods, learning their background, looking at just their um, physical history is fascinating. And there are so many resources, both fictional and non-fictional. Um, I highly recommend seeking them out. If you want to learn something about Japan and their past and their mythology, go and look it up on Google and you will find a plethora of resources. Yeah, uh, as I tell any student, there's always more history to learn. It doesn't matter what you're studying, there will always be more. So Japanese culture is absolutely amazing. And I'll actually tell you something interesting. The US cares more about Japanese history than Japan cares about Japanese history. Uh, if you go into school and they teach you Japanese history, it'll be like, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. It's very dull, it's very dry, and they don't, they actually skip over sections where they're like, and then we were evil, so we're not gonna talk about that. Uh, basically last century, a whole chunk of it is gone and they just don't want to talk about it. And in the US, we can talk about it. And that's that's one of those things about the, the culture of being able to go back and forth. We can talk about their history uh, more than they can because of all that fear and problems. So, you know, yes, go study it and then tell your Japanese friend because they might want to know or they may not know that they can find out about their history and make it interesting because they've never been taught. So that that is a, a huge thing for them. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming to this uh, panel. Uh, we appreciate uh, Jess and Keith uh, sharing their thoughts and everything on this. And if you have any questions, we'll be over on on the attendee side in the token chat room uh, for a few minutes afterward. If you have any other questions, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, keep in mind, we don't know absolutely everything, so, uh, but we can definitely let you know what we do know if you have a question. So thanks for your time.